verse 18. Uh, if you have a real good reference Bible, it's page 1539. 1539. <laughs> you got one? Say, hey, say what? Good. Where'd you get yours at a garage sale? <laughs> Luke 17 and 18. Okay, Luke 17, 1. Then said he unto his disciples, okay, Jesus talking. It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. See who's in trouble. Who, who's, gonna, who's in problems is the one who caused the offense. And then uh, Jesus said, It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast in the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Okay, that brings the offense at a level we understand. Okay, that's the only uh, idea of a death sentence that Jesus ordered in the New Testament. And you can see the context. This is a pretty grave offense. This is not the sissified stuff we have in America now. Uh, This is a pretty grave offense. This would be like, uh, you know, uh, somebody messing around with a little child. And Jesus said, uh, death sentence, mafia style, brick around the neck, throw them in the water. Jesus Christ said that, okay? So it's talking about pretty bad offenses. And then uh, verse 3, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Okay, that, as we get down to verse 10, would be our duty. Our duty. And then, of course, the apostles reacted in unison, uh, said unto him, Lord, increase our faith. Okay, so in the context, we see that the proper response of the offended party is involving faith. Okay, so that's that part. Now, chapter 18. Okay, chapter 18, um, a widow woman Chapter 18, 1, he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not, he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear it long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth. Okay, question again about faith. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand this. I pray that uh, folks that have... Uh, been offended and or have uh, crossed the path of somebody that's been truly offended, I mean big ones like you said, that uh, we would know uh, how to respond in these things. And uh, we're never going to bat a thousand. We can't, uh, we're not able to, but uh, yet there's a time where we can respond properly and help us do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, both passages involve uh, offenses. Okay, and they're pretty grave, big ones. They're not the sissified stuff we have in America like this past week, one boy gets suspended from school because he would not protest the walkout about guns. So they, you know, lacked tolerance and suspended him from school. And another young man in a college uh, in class entitled Christianity, um, <clears throat> Self, sin, and salvation, Uh, the woman, female professor, gave a video on transgenderism, asked the girls to comment. They would not comment. He commented and said, biologist, tell us there's only male or female, and he gets suspended from class. Okay, I'm not talking about that kind of offenses. Those kind of sissified little stuff that we have in our culture was prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24, As a sign of his coming, he says, many will be offended. 
And that's because people are madly in love with themselves. Okay, I'm not talking about those offenses. I'm talking about big stuff. Okay, I'm talking about a lifetime of abuse that children sometimes get from their parents. Sexual abuse, verbal abuse. I'm talking about um, a murder. Okay, theft. Uh, I'm talking about big stuff that people really endure. Okay, and... Uh, these, and then the idea is, how are we to respond to those things, okay, to these offenses that we have in life? Now, this emotional pain that uh, people have reveals that uh, men and women, we are not animals. Animals do not have emotional pain like people do. Okay, granted, yeah, I know animal will cower and will remember things. That's different. I'm not talking about holding a grudge or unforgiveness for years and sometimes until death, where you would think at death maybe parties that were offended would come together. In some cases, no, that doesn't happen. And a lot of times the offended party can justify themselves while saying, well, that person did this. They wronged me. And so I have a right to feel this way. Yeah, but two wrongs don't make a right. Okay, and I'm not going to say we're going to bat a thousand, but still the idea is how could you help somebody in this idea? Okay, we, the offended party who's been harmed is responsible for our reactions. And I'll give you a Bible character to show that. Okay, there was a pastor years ago that had a, a couple in his church. They were Korean. They had a little baby. The couple's name was Wong, and uh, the pastor said about the little baby, well, it's, it's really yellow, and he said, Pastor, two Wongs don't make a white, <laughs> and so that one said, you got to figure that one out, <laughs> okay, and so the idea is uh, two wrongs don't make a right, okay, um, so how do we respond to these things? Again, the emotional aspect of people carry that we carry reveals that we are different than animals. And the person can be a person can be perfectly healthy physically and mentally, but the emotional pain that they will continue to harbor can cause physical and mental illness. It can. That emotional aspect, the emotion the emotions of bitterness, grudges, unforgiveness can ruin a person spiritually. Two wrongs don't make a right. Okay, I'm not justifying the wrong that the offended party did. Jesus Christ said, woe unto them. Okay, but we still are held accountable for our reactions to those things. Now, in some cases, okay, in some cases, say on the street, if you're street preaching, passing out tracts, in some cases, a, a police officer can... Uh, bring uh, emotions to the issue, the turmoil, and cause a party to react. Okay, and then that officer can justify himself, but that party is held responsible for their actions. That's why Jesus Christ said that we ought to be harmless, wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Yeah, political officials can do, do those things purposely. But we're still held accountable for our reaction. And so the offended party is responding. We are, I am, responding for my reactions to wrongs committed against me. Now, there are some people in the Bible, I'll just run two or three of them, that overcame some pretty grave offenses. Again, I'm not talking about this little stuff we got going on in our country. Okay, Uh, I mean grave offense. Joseph. Uh, Joseph's uh, brother sold him into slavery. About 17 years old, and his brothers uh, wanted to kill him, but they didn't really want their blood on They had enough fear of God they were afraid to kill him, and so they sold him as justified. They sold his brother into slavery. And no doubt, Joseph cried himself to sleep for a long time, homesick. Can't imagine why his brothers did to this to him. And then... Uh, uh, and then is charged with a false crime, so he's thrown into prison. In prison, he's in shackles, and Psalm says that he, his feet were, legs were wounded by the shackles. 
And then he be, uh, becomes, uh, somehow gets in the good graces of the jailer, and he becomes a trustee. But still, a trustee in a jail really doesn't comfort a person much. Okay? And still the idea, I'm thinking, my brothers, I knew they hated me, but man. But you know, there's no record of bitterness with Joseph. Now, I'm not saying he didn't have it, but there's no record of it. Okay, and, uh, and then after the truth came out, now his dad, Jacob, has to, people overlook him. Can you imagine him looking at his sons? After this, you guys, you guys lied to me. What kind of sons do that? Jacob had to forgive too. Well, after Jacob's death, the boys were kind of afraid what Joseph was going to be because he was, man, he was a pretty big dog at that time. And so they said, Dad said, you're supposed to forgive us. Now, I don't know if Dad said it or not, but Joseph forgave him. Okay, right reaction. Okay, Joseph is probably the greatest types of Christ in the Bible. Okay, another character, Daniel. Okay, Daniel is 15 or so, 15 years old, and here comes a Babylonian army, surrounds the city for 18 months. People are dying, starving to death, dead in the streets. Okay, um, I'm sorry, no, he was taken before that. But still the idea that in that raid, his parents probably got killed. But here he is, 15 years old, and under three attacks, they, they uh, Babylonians kidnapped, brought captives, 4,600 people into Babylon, into Iraqi country. Okay, Muslim territory, even though Muslims weren't um, invented yet at that time, if you want to use that word. Uh, the general spirit was there. They had the moon god and everything. But here Daniel, 15-year-old kid, ripped away from his home, no doubt cried himself to sleep at night for a while, homesick, probably thought maybe this is going to last for a couple of years, ended up being until the day he died. He was uh, forced to be a eunuch. You say, how do you know he's forced to be a eunuch? Uh, just think about it. I don't think it was something he voluntarily chose to do. Okay, and just ripped from his culture, ripped from his family, and there's no record of bitterness. Again, I'm not saying that he wasn't, but at least there's no record of it. And then he served faithfully in two different administrations and died under the media Persia reign. Okay, Joseph is a type of Christ. Daniel is a type of the Holy Ghost. Joseph was made second ruler in the kingdom. Daniel is made third ruler in the kingdom. So you have Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And so these are names that we probably all can say we know a boy named Daniel and Joseph. Why? Because people in their conscience says, well, there's a person with good character. I would like my children to be named after that man. Okay, there's another guy in the Bible, David. David was made uh, a fugitive of the law. Several years ago, some of us, do you remember an old uh, series called The Fugitive? Black and white. I used to like to watch that. Okay, uh, but uh, Daniel was a fugitive. All the post offices had his picture in there. And uh, there's one man, the tyrant, the king of uh, Israel, wanted him dead. For no good reason, just because he was jealous, insecure, Okay, so he wanted him dead. So he's out hiding in the woods and everything. In those woods, he's writing a psalm, singing to the Lord, writing another psalm. Okay, and then Saul dies. You would think after Saul's death, Daniel would be out there as soon, soon as the dirt got piled. Man, he would be out there dancing on his grave. No, David actually said some very nice words at the memorial service. How about Saul? All three men had grave offenses. Major offenses happened to them in life and overcame them. Okay? Here's another character in the Bible. And this is where, where we get responsible. Numbers chapter 20. Front of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Chapter 20. Now, this one shows that we are held accountable for our reaction. Okay, two wrongs don't make a right, meaning the wrong that the offended party committed and your wrong for not responding as the Lord would want you to. 
Two wrongs don't make a right. I am not responsible for the first wrong of the offended, of the offender. I am responsible for my reaction. In Numbers chapter 20, Moses is the leader of Israel, two to three million Jews. Uh, these people multiple times griped and complained. It was like a little poodle yipping at the heels of Joseph or of Moses. And in verse 1 of chapter 20, Then came the children of Israel, even a whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Okay, so that's his older sister, 13 years older. And there was uh, no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses, against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Referring back in number six about Korah and those gripers. Number 16, I'm sorry. And then he says, why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? Well, first off, uh, he didn't make them. You could have stayed back. So don't be griping at me for a decision you made a long time ago. But still, okay, they're griping. They're, I mean, they're really nipping at his heels. Now, this guy Moses, this guy Moses in Numbers 12, verse 3, God had him write down he was the meekest man on earth. And I'll bet you anything, when Moses wrote that down, he stopped his... Are you serious? That's right. I'm looking at your heart. I'm looking at your heart, Moses. Whatever. Whatever. And if you read some of the things, how Moses reacted, yeah, you will see that. Now, that's what Paul said about Jesus Christ. He said, he's gentle and meek, 2 Corinthians 10. Jesus Christ said about himself, I am lowly and meek in heart. And Paul said to Timothy that when you instruct people, make sure that meekness is a part of that instruction. Meekness in general. It's an attitude. Now, that's, a, that's one unique difference between the wisdom of this world versus the godly wisdom of the Bible is, is meekness. Well, the wisdom of the world is they want to impress you with their vast knowledge. A man that's meekness and he's got godly wisdom, he wants to impress you with the wisdom of God. That's a difference. Where you walk away admiring God, not the man. That's a difference. That's a difference of teaching the Bible through God's ways and man's ways. Okay, so this Moses guy was a pretty laid-back fella. I mean, he was so laid-back, he could almost walk horizontally. <laughs> I mean, he was a laid-back guy. But he was a leader of two to three million people. And I tell you, you can push a guy far enough, and you push a rat in a corner, I'm not saying most a rat, but if you push an animal in a corner, many animals, instead of running, will fight. So verse 5, it says, And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt? He didn't make you. He didn't make you. To bring us into in unto this evil place. It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly. And that was a good thing. They probably got time to cool down a little bit. And under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. The Lord said unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, gather, uh, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock. Get it. Get the word. Speak to the rock. Sit, rock. Sit. Good rock. Good rock. Doing good. Sit. Okay, well, he's going to speak to it. That's the command. Speak to the rock. And he said, Speak unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall, it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. Now, as he's getting this congregation together, there's no doubt some gripers. It wasn't that he went from one place to another without a bunch of Jews around him griping. So as he's walking to this rock location, he's got the um, gripers who are nipping at his heels. And, he's, and his blood is starting to boil. Okay, and so it says this. He said unto them, Hear now, you rebels. 
talking to the ones who were just griping at him. Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod and smote the rock. The Lord said, speak to it. He'd already done that first time. Not, no, Lord said, no, not a second time. Now, there are some doctrinal implications of it, which I'm going to skip, but still the idea. Moses lifted up his hand with his rod and smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their beasts also. The Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, because you believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Okay, a Moses was not held accountable for the griping of the Jews. Moses was held accountable for his reaction. Okay, when he throws out, you rebels, he's upset. And any of us could say, rightly so. But the Lord said, Moses... Sorry. You get to see Canaan, but you're not going in there. Why? Because we are held accountable for our reaction. We are held accountable for those things. And so Moses was 120 years old. You, you can read this story in Deuteronomy 34. He said his strength was not abated. His eyes were not dim. So God took him on the top of this mountain, Mount Nebo, and he said, hey, take a gander, look. Moses had good eyesight at 120. He could have easily probably reached Abraham's age at 185. Okay, or Job's at 140. This is soon after the flood, so their genetics was much better than it is today. And so Moses died prematurely at 120 because of a reaction. We're held accountable for our reactions. Okay? We're not held accountable for the actions of others, but we are held accountable for our reactions. And a lot of this is a battle in our minds. Our thoughts. Okay? A lot of it is, is in our mind. Front mind, back, front and back, in our head. They say it's in your head. Yeah, sometimes it is. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And Ephesians 4, he said again, Paul said to the church of Ephesus, that we need to be renewing our mind day by day. So it is in our mind. Okay, and Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says that it gives us a list of what we're supposed to think about. And that tells us we are to control our thoughts. Okay, we cannot control the actions of others to us. We can control our thoughts about that. And again, I'm not going to say you're going to bat a thousand. I'm not going to bat a thousand. But the idea is the Lord is gracious and the Lord will help us. Philippians 4, verse 8, that finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are, I'm sorry, pure, lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, that one verse would be a good enough to discredit watching the news. Okay, but um, even at that, think on these things. Now, if you would look in 1 Timothy chapter 6, you see, a person's thought life can make or break a person. A person's thought life can lead you to victory or defeat. It's a matter of what's in our head a lot of times. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, it says, If any man teach otherwise... And consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. Look at the mind. But notice there's a sin that's often not even talked about. Evil surmisings. That is one of devils or demons' favorite ploy. 
Evil surmising. So surmising is to suppose without evidence. The trick goes like this. Husband's working, wife's working. In this age, day and age, often that's the case, but it doesn't have to be. Husband can be working, wife can be at home, but a thought comes percolating, coming flying through the air, said she, he's probably flirting with some gal at work. Mine comes through his head. It's usually about 30 minutes before they get to see each other at the, the time of the day when they show up. Thought comes to his head that she's probably been watching soaps all afternoon. I don't know. Do they still got soap operas? I don't even know. Uh, but uh, he's pro- she's probably been flirting with somebody. And so evil surmising is, I'm supposing that's taking place. And if they allow that to go around a second time or a third time and they start stewing on that, instead of seeing each other with a kiss, it's going to be a different form of a kiss. And that's a trick. The devil plays those things, evil surmisings. Where charity, and a, a definite, a one partial definition of charity is, thinketh no evil. Where you're thinking the worst of that individual. Where you, you say, yeah, but what if evil comes out? Deal with it when you come out with it. But don't be having all these emotions by your just supposing without evidence. But again, the idea is, what's going on up here in our head? What's going up in our mind? If you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, while you're turning to 2 Corinthians 10, a Bible believer uh, does not discount true scientific studies. Science can help a person... In your Christian walk. Now, I'm saying science. I'm not talking scientism. Scientists, you can tell if you observe a scientist, they will convert to scientism because scientism is a religion with no evidence. Science is evidence. For example, the great genius passed away this last week, Stephen Hawkins. Okay. And, oh, Neil deGrasse, the brilliant Neil deGrasse is going to interview him. What happened before the Big Bang? Oh, the big, intelligent Hawkins says, there was nothing before the Big Bang. That's scientism. Okay, take nothing and put it in a jar and go to the laboratory and demonstrate, boom, and watch it take place. That would be science. Okay, science is compatible with the Bible. Scientism is not. Scientism is arrogance against the Bible. And so we need to recognize the difference. So you can go to true science and help us to understand the Bible. Now, Satan will distort science to scientism. And people who always brag about science will say it's not compatible with the Bible, and I will say to them, scientism is not, but science is. And then have a scientific discussion to either disprove evolutionary theory or to prove the Bible, which is a very enjoyable discussion. Okay, And so we can go to science. Now, science teaches us that in the middle of your brain is a pineal gland. Okay, It's in the shape of a pine cone. That's why they call it a pineal gland. In that, that pineal gland helps control our emotional levels by melatonin and things like that. But that pineal gland, the devil can take something scientific and distort it. And the distortion of the pineal gland is the all-seeing eye of Horus. They call it the third eye. Now, the pineal gland, it appears to be a portion of the body where God helps that to help us to connect with spiritual things. The pineal gland is very significant in that fashion, where the third eye is where we can see spiritual things, understand spiritual, I say see, but understand spiritual things, but the devil will take it and pervert it to the all-seeing eye of horse. That's what's on the back of your dollar bill. That's a perversion and evil. That would be the evil eye, the one-eyed of cyclone, okay? The one-eyed... The Bible mentions the evil eye three times. The first time was with rich people. That jumps into the Freemasonry and a very demonic idea. It's one of the 13 sins in the Bible listed in Mark chapter 7 
that come from the heart, evil eye. That's the bad right eye of the Antichrist where somebody, a parent will squint the right eye and look to you through the left eye and that's the, they're giving you the evil eye, man. Okay, in the, in the medical profession, that's called sinister ocular. Isn't that funny? Sinister ocular, looking through the left eye because the Antichrist will do that. He's going to get shot in the head and have a bad right eye. Okay, and so we can learn from these scientifically from the pineal gland is where the devil will pervert it to the evil eye, but the Bible will say that's, that's a portion of a connection into spiritual understanding where we have enlightened eyes. Now, there's an interesting study. A lady named Jennifer Luke performed the first study of the effects of fluoride on the pineal gland. Fluoride, interesting. It was a very toxic chemical that major corporations didn't know what to do with, so they didn't want to just throw it out, and so they passed some laws to say it has health benefits. Help your teeth. Okay, and puts it in the toothpaste. No, here's what fluoride does. From this lady's study, she discovered that fluoride is a magnet to the pineal gland. And it will absorb fluoride more than any organ of the body, including the bones, the pineal gland. And it calcifies the pineal gland where it will not, cannot operate properly. Therefore, people become emotional wrecks. The Nazis and the Russians put fluoride in the drinking water of the prisoners in the concentration camps to make them docile. And that's where Americans are becoming. Either docile or they're emotional wrecks. And you can study that idea of the fluoride. That's what this lady, she studied this in the 1990s. So we can learn from science. It calcifies the gland, therefore it cannot work properly. And mercury is another chemical that goes to the pineal gland. Mercury and mercury feelings and mercury in the immunization shots. And, of course, it also will calcify the pineal gland where it does not allow proper operation. One can use herbs to try to cleanse it, which is helpful, but one long-term effect is meditation and fasting will help heal the pineal gland and allow it to work properly. Now, meditation, the proper meditation, you have demonic meditation. Uh, Demonic or a perverted meditation is to clear your mind. Passive. Bible meditation is to think. So the idea of the Bible meditation is take a Bible verse, memorize it in your head. When you meditate on it, that transfers from the head to the heart. And that will help heal our pineal gland and allow it to operate properly. And that way we could kind of connect, shall we say, or understand it in spiritual things better. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is where I sent you to, and he talks about the weapons of our warfare. And again, a lot of it's in our mind. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Okay? Warring after the flesh, where two people having a heated argument, okay, and one in the heat of the argument pops them. Okay, that's warring after the flesh. Okay, so that's not the technique the Lord wants us to use. Then he says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God and pulling down of the strongholds. Casting down imaginations. What is that? Evil surmisings. Imagination. Fear. Fear, a good acronym for fear is F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. Now, people in, a, in authorities know that fear is the way you control people. Fear can paralyze you. Okay? And people will harbor these fear from offenses. Okay? In rape cases. Okay? Where there's a fear. What if that party comes back? And it's a logical fear. But fear and depression and bitterness, these are thoughts that occur in the back of our mind, in the back of our head. And if you can imagine it this way, the, when we have these thoughts in the back of our head, it makes the back of our head heavy, and so it will make us want to fall in bed and stay in bed and paralyze us. 
if we could transfer the thoughts from the back of our head to the front of our head through the pineal gland and through the frontal, uh, the prefrontal cortex of our mind, that will put the thoughts in our mind. It's like it will drive us to action. Like the emotion of fear and the emotion of excitement does the same thing physically to your body. You have the same reaction physically. Fear, excitement. And it just depends, what are you going to use with that physical reaction? So how do we transfer it from the back to our front? 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 5 says, Casting down vain imaginations. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So one good way of doing it is, in the old days, was it Ben Franklin that said that when you get angry, count to ten. Before you react. Okay? What's well, not bad? If you're very angry, count to 100. <laughs> well, counting forward is one thing. Counting backwards is different. What, what alerts the pineal gland and the frontal mind is counting backwards. And so when we take this thought of fear in our back, and we go five, four, three, two, one, we've alerted the middle of our mind, our pea brain, and then we can throw a good thought in the front of our mind that will bring excitement and we can get us up and move forward. Okay, whatever fear you got. Okay, you can see a great athlete physically. But like in basketball. Okay, you take basketball. Some guys, five seconds left in a game, free throw line, one point down. You can almost read their eyes and see who's going to miss and make. Why? Fear is in the back of the mind of the one that guarantees going to miss. Confidence is in the front of the mind, and that confident guy goes to that line, and in fact, he wants to be at that line every time. He wants the ball in his hands at the end every time. And in my generation, that was Larry Bird. He loved it. Now, there's a guy in this generation, LeBron James. I do have to admit that some of his skills were good enough. I don't appreciate his social attitude. But when you watch that guy to the go to the line, you don't know what's going to happen because you can read it in his eyes. Now, I'm not going to tell him the secret because I'd rather miss it. <laughs> I'm not going to pull him in a huddle and say, LeBron, go five, four, three, two, one. And I'm not going to tell him, now put it in your mind you're about the excitement after you make it. And then he's going to go to the line confidently and probably drain it. But if he don't, still, why go to the line with a negative fear? Could guarantee, that's guarantee miss. Okay, now I've been at that line on several occasions. And, you know, it's kind of exciting. Okay, but still, the idea, it's going up here. What's going on? Is, is our thought in the back of our mind or is our thought in the front of our mind? And what's going to help us? Okay, in, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, cast down imaginations, that fear in the back of our mind. And pull excitement to the front of our mind and be excited about the grace of God, what God is going to do. Okay, fear of witnessing. If you're afraid to open up your mouth for the Lord, okay, get yourself in a position where you're going to open up your mouth or put yourself in a position where you need to open up your mouth. And right when you get to that, say, five, four, three, two, one, Spirit of God, I'm going to rely upon you and I'm going to ask you to give me the right words at the right time. And now I am excited about witnessing for Jesus Christ. You overcome that fear. Okay, and so the thing is, what you're doing is you're taking the thoughts from the back Thrown it in the front, and then you can move forward. A person can be bedridden by fear. And it's all in them. they can be physically fine, mentally fine, but their fear can paralyze them. And they say, yeah, but that person did. I'm sorry, I know what that person did, okay, and I know it hurts, but you are responsible you are responsible. You need to take control of yourself. I mean, this has been going on long enough. 
And, and some people, oh, th- that's hurting me. I know. And it hurts me to see you like this when it's not necessary. And I'm not discrediting the pain that they have. But Joseph overcame his pain. Daniel overcame his pain. David overcame his pain. And, and Paul said, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. God has given us these abilities and the grace. And so the thing is, how do we get from point A to point B? Well, the Bible helps us with that. And science can help us with that. True science can help us with some of those things. It's a battle in our mind. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask you'd help each and every one of us, ones that are, have hurts that they can overcome like Joseph, like Daniel, like David, and help us realize that Moses probably kicked himself several times for his reaction. And uh, Lord, I just pray you'd help us realize that there's a reaction. Okay, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't know for certain you're going to heaven, obviously we have an interest in that, but that wasn't topic this morning. But still, a lot of people carry hurts. And so how do we respond to those? The Bible gives us our answers, and so the thing is just making, using the tools that God has given. While the piano play, the altar's open if you'd like to use it. Lord, I thank you for your words, and I do pray and ask you to help us to uh, recognize there, man, a lot of hurt, hurting people everywhere, just hurting. And help us to do what we can to try to help them, and of course, bring them to the Savior if they're not saved, and, and then introduce them to the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. And Lord, help us to uh, realize there are some things, tools that you've given in life, uh, some things that we can learn to help us uh, spiritually. And I pray you'd help us to be willing to access those tools. But help us recognize that it's thee and thee only that gives us the grace. And we appreciate that. We thank you for it. We love you for it. And help us to draw closer to thee. In Jesus' name, amen.